thank you very much for, for joining us today. Um, this is um, a series of workshop that has been um, initiated by the Applied Research Collaboration um, Implementation Leads. The first workshop uh, was um, last month and was led by Paul um, and um, was about impact in implementation. Um, the third workshop is going to be led by Graeme Curry from NIHR Arc West Midlands. Um, and he is leading a, a workshop on the role of organizational science in implementation. Um, and a workshop in January led by will be led by Caroline Watkins will be about capacity building. Um, so today we're looking at um, co-production and I'm just going to say a few words um, in as an as an introduction. Here we are. So just some general points. The session will be recorded, including the discussion and comments. We've had lots of interest um, in this workshop and many people aren't able to attend. So had many requests for this to be um, recorded. Please ensure you're on mute to avoid um, black background noise and interference. Um, and given that quite a lot of people had signed up and we're already reaching 100 participants, it's very unlikely that we're going to be able to um, invite people um, to speak. So we ask you to please put your questions and comments into the chat. And Paul Wilson, um, my um, my co-chair um, is going to moderate those parts of the discussion. So the aims for, for today um, are really to move the conversation on um, about implementation and co-production um, to ensure that the research that we do actually benefits those in our arc footprints who have the poorest health. Um, and we want to develop and articulate a shared understanding. Um, and this workshop is about that really getting a shared understanding. It's, it's less about giving people ideas about how to do co-production. It's more about what approaches are there and what can we agree on? What principles can we agree on that we can share across our, our um, 15 footprints? And the second aim is to start to think about what the landscape would, should, or could look like um, to make that sort of co-production and implementation um, a reality. Um, I want to offer three short definitions of co-production, um, all of which highlight um, the, the idea of sharing power and responsibility for research. But um, in my view, the three um, build on each other um, to develop greater um, inclusivity, and um, and a wider a wider horizon of what co-production and implementation might mean. So this is the first definition I want to offer from Involve. Um, back in 2018, before we even knew about COVID, um, it was about um, a research project, co-producing a research project, and it's very much focused um, on research and the generation um, of knowledge. The second definition I want to offer you comes from Redmond uh, et al, um, and I think this one was published in the BMJ, and this looks at co-production as a collaborative model, and again it's about sharing of power with stakeholders and researchers working together, and here we first develop a clear indication that co-production isn't just about research, it is also um, about implementation. And the third um, 
the third definition I want to offer is that which comes from a blog from Beresford and Beresford and et al., uh, which is um, wider reaching. Uh, it talks about decision making, actively participating in decision making, rebalancing hierarchies um, and repairing some of the mistrust. Um, that has been built up over over decades and the inequalities in power in, um, to ensure that marginalized perspectives and and those with lived experience can actually make a contribution um, to what health and social care look like. So all of the contributions we're going to hear about are somewhere on the spectrum. Most of them, I think, um, very close to definition two um, or three. So what needs to change for this to happen? Um, and one of the first things I think is to see implementation as not just a technical um, task. We need to really um, shift from the sort of pipeline model um, to um, a model in which dialogue and collaboration um, are prioritized. And it's really about what evidence is needed um, to be generated and to be implemented to benefit underserved communities. Um, and thirdly, what needs to happen is, uh, and that, that um, particularly, <laughs> Um, directed at, at funders is that we need to sustain relationships between communities and researchers um, from not just um, individual research projects, but to wider networks to enable that to happen. Um, and recent calls, I'm sure many of you on this call will have been busy um, to submit, uh, uh, to, to submit um, a proposal um, uh, to the NHSE, uh, something very similar to this about um, research um, develop, uh, network development. Um, so, the program today um, is wide ranging and is going to, I hope, stimulate conversation. And we're first going to hear from Sophie and Magdalena about the Piper project. Um, Lucy is going to talk about the integrating co-production into implementation research. Um, Jean is uh, Jean Fader is on a flight home, so uh, from Ethiopia, so he he won't be able to join us. But um, he and um, Michelle Farr have um, produced a video um, about PPI from PPI to co-production, and we're going to hear that short video from them. Uh, thirdly, and then. Um, the uh, team from Arc West are going to talk about knowledge mobilization with underserved communities, and that uh, includes a panel um, of um, people involved in the um, Health Research Ambassador Program. Okay, so I'm going to now stop sharing my presentation and start sharing the presentation from. Sophie and Magdalena, and uh, just give me a moment, both of you, to load your presentation. Okay, can you see the presentation? Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Sabi. Can I hand over to the two of you? Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. And we'll, we'll introduce ourselves briefly. Um, I'm Sophie Staniszewska. I'm Professor of Patient and Public Involvement and Engagement and Experiences of Care at Warwick Medical School. Magdalena, do you want to? Yeah, so hi, I'm Magdalena Scribant. I'm the Public Involvement Lead for the Applied Research Collaboration West Midlands. 
That's great, thank you. And I guess the first thing to say is that we're here representing quite a big team. So um, colleagues uh, who are involved in this project are sort of far and wide um, include Kiel with Krisha Jejits and colleagues and uh, Joe Langley at uh, Joe, Joe at uh, Sheffield Hallam, Joe Langley at Sheffield Hallam. But we also have a range of collaborators from Ottawa, from NICE, from Sky, from the Centre of Engagement as well, the NIHR Centre for Engagement, and, and others who are all contributing to the thinking behind the study. The other thing to say before we get going is that we've just started. So we started on the 1st of September. So really what we're going to present to you is the plan that we have moving forward. And we're really keen to get your thoughts and perspectives, your, your knowledge about what has gone before and some thoughts about where we might end up. Um, next slide, please. It seems to be stuck. Hang on. Oh, we've had a few technical issues today. <laughs> Thank yes. you. Is that slide two? Yes, that's Great. that's perfect. Yeah. That's perfect. So just to describe a little bit about the beginnings of our thinking, this project has been one of those that has had a long um, gestation. It started probably almost a decade ago in terms of our thinking. And the first thing that really happened was that um, I was uh, chairing a nice patient experience guideline development group. And um, this was a whole new area of thinking for NICE, patient experience never been done before. And we had six um, what were, what were then called patient contributors um, who were part of that process. The usual number is two. So this was quite unusual and we had six really sort of active, um, incredibly experienced people who were part of the guideline development group. And for those of you who know how NICE works, it's a very integrated process of, of development, drawing on evidence, but also discussing that evidence and drawing on, lived ex drawing on lived experience. So we were using the Warwick patient experience framework to help us shape our thinking and just think more about what areas of health we wanted to cover, health and social care. But during the development of the guidance, it became really clear that it wasn't just the guidance that our public contributors were interested in. It was about what do we then do with it? So how can we take this guidance and go back to the hospital trust they were involved with and actually make a difference to what care is provided? And these discussions were woven through many of the wider discussions about what should go into the guidance. And it, it was starting us thinking about implementation. And at that point, NICE didn't have a role around implementation. And we wondered what we could offer our public contributors in terms of active roles and in terms of support. But it was very clear that at that stage, um, implementation wasn't part of the picture and that we had to finish at the end of the um, publication of guidance, but it always left a residual feeling of we, we could have done more, there could have been other things that our public contributors could have done. And I suspect that they what they ended up doing was to go back to those hospital trusts they were working with and actually use the guidance, but without that support. So it, it started off um, in these early days of us thinking, well, what more could we have done? And I guess it started us on a quest of trying to secure funding for a project that would allow us to, to develop that, that thinking. I would say that NICE is now looking at implementation and there's an implementation strategy group, but in those early days, it was very much not part of this picture. So over the next, um, well, quite a lot of few years, we started conversations with ARC West Midlands and with others to really try and unravel what could this area look like? Next slide, please. So in terms of the state of play, I know today we're focusing on co-production and implementation, but just thinking about patient and public involvement and implementation. So both areas of work, both PPI broadly and implementation um, science and practice have really large bodies of literature behind them. If anyone has ever tried to search those bodies of work, you realize the enormous number of papers that have been published, but rarely have they been linked. So rarely have we talked about what role could patients, publics, communities, citizens have 
within the field of impl implementation, either research or practice. So we were starting to discover there wasn't much thinking going on that brought these two bodies of work together. And I think for those of us who work in this area, that felt quite unusual. So when we look at other um, relevant research areas, we see a growing role for patients and public contributors. But in implementation, it felt very partial. And if anyone's ever looked at the frameworks and the theories that guide the research and the practice, again, stakeholders are mentioned quite routinely, but rarely are those stakeholders patients. So there's a real, real gap. And we've put this quote in just to sort of illustrate that. So Chris Burton and Joe Rycroft Malone talked about the importance of exploring the potential um, of patients and, and public in implementation. And they really felt that there was a largely sort of untapped resource that we need to be thinking about and the significance that that, that, that as, as a development could bring. So this was all feeding into our thinking um, over, over those years. And we felt there was a real gap here and that's what the Piper study is going to address. So the title of the Piper study is developing a role for patients and the public in the implementation of health and social care research evidence into practice, and it's funded by NIHR HSMDR program. Next slide, please. Oh, well done. <laughs> so I'm going to um, just go through some of the sort of research questions, and then Magdalena is going to just give an overview, and then I'll come back to the specifics of what we're going to be doing. So the key um, research questions we have are, how can patients, carers, service users, and the public be involved in the implementation of health and social care research into practice? So having come from that experience with NICE and with continued discussions, you know, what, what can they do? Is there a role and what does that look like? So the second question addresses what types of roles, contributions and impact can patients, carers, service users and the public make to the implementation of health and social care evidence into practice? So again, thinking about, about those different sorts of contributions, the different sorts of roles and what difference that could make. And certainly that very much reflected um, the public contributors we were working with at NICE who really saw the potential for what they could do. And then importantly, the third question addresses how can we support that process? How can we support those individuals who want to become involved in implementation to actually make that difference and make that change in practice? And then the final one is how can we co-produce the knowledge, this knowledge that explores this greater role for carers, service users and the public? And that's really important because I think in implementation science, particularly the whole idea of co-production, particularly with public contributors, has been so small and partial as an area. Um, and we're really keen that that discussion and debate opens up. Next slide, please. So the, the overarching framework that we're using for Piper is realist evaluation. And we felt that this is a really suitable framework for an area that is developing. Um, and it's very much focused on uh, theory, program theory development of what works for whom, in what context and why. So it's very flexible, it's very iterative. It draws on a range of different sorts of knowledge and expertise, which feels like the right approach, um, and particularly in an area that is relatively new and we need to almost have our collective community brain operating within. Um, so realist evaluation will guide each of the work packages and it's very much aligned with our intention to co-produce key elements of the study. So we are setting up that, that part of the study at the moment. And we will go through an iterative process, process of theory development. And we've already seen that in the early work we've done around the scoping review. And as I, as I said, I think realist approaches because they are flexible and they draw on a wider range of information and insight, it isn't just limited to us doing a systematic review of the literature, which would mean we found relatively little and probably couldn't say a lot. So it's, uh, it, it is an important approach, I think, when we are in these early stages of building our thinking. Next slide, please. And over so, to Magdalena. Yeah, it's so over to me now to talk about co-production that underpins our project. And as Sophie, um, Sophie has talked about and Sabi in her introduction, co-production is really important to us in this project because obviously we want to lead by example. We want to talk 
in our project, we want to find out about how public contributors and patients and service users and carers can be involved in implementing research. But in this project, we very much want to lead by example. And every aspect of our work is going to be co-produced with public contributors. And as Sophie said, we started on the 1st of September. So we're at the very beginning of our journey. But what's really important to us is not only putting thought and consideration into who we recruit to this group of public contributors that will be working alongside us every step of the way. But absolutely, it's important to us that we have diversity within the group. If we want to be working with underserved communities, it's really important that the group of people we recruit or we, we work with as partners alongside us in our project is diverse to help us reach those underserved communities. So just to um, just to talk to the slide, we'll we'll have this public contributor group that we're setting up now, and they'll be with us throughout the whole course of the program. And we very much will be working partnership with us on every single work package that we're working through. And Sophie's going to describe those in more detail um, in the next few slides. Um, but one of the key things we're going to be working on with our public partners is some vignettes, some case studies that we'll really use to help people contextualise the learnings of public contributors as implementers of research evidence. And that's really key for us in this project and getting those case studies right and pitching them the right way and presenting them the right way is absolutely a key output for our project. And that's why our public partners will be so important to us as we develop this project. Okay, next slide. And so this is just a big overview slide and I appreciate you won't be able to see the detail on here and it looks really busy. Um, but in the middle, in the middle block, you can see the four key work packages in different colors and they're obviously in different timescales. But underneath it in the green box, you'll see there, we've got our public contributors working with us through all the work packages. And actually having them involved with us right from the start will help us really start to think about how we can implement the findings from this project into those communities. So thinking about how this group will work with us to implement the research evidence that we generate is really important to us and is, thinking, is forming our thinking at these very early stages of this project. Okay, next slide please to Sophie to talk in more detail about each of the four work packages. Great, thanks Magdalena. So where we are at the moment is work package one, and this is a realist uh, literature review, um, and we're following a six step process. So look, we're looking at key databases at the moment and we're developing the search strategy. We're also trying to develop an understanding of how well the search strategy works, which is I think probably particularly challenging in an area where things are just starting to emerge. So it feels like we've caught the beginnings of something. People are writing about this as a potential area, but they're often publishing protocols for work. So fewer studies are starting to report on what they've done. Um, so it means that the search strategy um, only reaches, I think, part of the papers that might be out there and might be relevant. We're also interested in searching adjacent areas. Um, if we struggle to find papers that are directly focused on public involvement and implementation, so areas like shared decision making and quality improvement, but we're we've sort of paused on those at the moment while we do them run the main searches. I think one of the um, aspects of a, a realist approach is the sort of importance placed on grey literature. So literature that isn't published formally in journals and finding examples from patient organisations of what they're doing around implementation is going to be really important for us. And of course, that's really hard to search for because the patient organisations aren't putting their work out using the terms that we would use within the research searches. But it's a vital part of this jigsaw puzzle if you like of trying to understand what people are doing and through our NICE collaboration we know that NICE are doing work around implementation now and they're looking at what community organizations and patient organizations are doing so that's going to be really important for us and the approach we were using at the moment um, was really to sort of search documents and papers for those initial ideas those initial beginnings of theory relating to how we understand the role, the contribution and the impact of patients, services, users, carers and the public in implementation. So it's 
it's a sort of quite an iterative process. And those of you who've undertaken realist reviews know this very well. It's a sort of create creative iterative process that means that a lot of what we're doing is finding authors who've started publishing in the area, following them and tracking them. We found some um, uh, overviews of um, sort of scan, scanning of the horizon, if you like, of what's been happening. So we're following up those as well. And then with our collaborator group, we're also um, collecting papers that they're identifying too. So I think it's a sort of multi-pronged approach and eventually we'll get to a, a number of papers and we've said between 50 and 100 where we are really going to um, focus in terms of uh, the data extraction in terms of trying to start building up the theory of what's working uh, and I'm leading this work package with Julia Walsh um, and then the second work package which will overlap the first work package a bit will use the theories we've developed from um, work package one to inform our qualitative data collection and um, we're very conscious that I guess what we're expecting from the literature review will be partial theory because it isn't a well published area of work so we will only get so far from that literature and from the grey literature so in work package two this will be particularly important I think for us because we'll be collecting qualitative data to really strengthen our theory and help us understand the different ways that patients and the public can be involved in implementation. So in this work package, we're going to use a particular type of interview called a realist um, interview, and it's going to be pretty much semi-structured. And what this allow us to do is to explore whether the sorts of theory that we've evolved in the work package one holds for an individual. So people talk about the teacher learner um, sort of cycle in these interviews where you can say, this is what we're thinking. This is, seems to be how it's working. Does that sound right to you? Or would you change that in any way? And the participant can say that rings a bell, but in my experience, it worked like this. So it's rather than a sort of open question, it's quite a directed question and allows us to refine um, and sort of confirm and add their interpretation to our sort of developing theory. So it does mean that when we're trying to find people, we'll be using those principles of realist sampling. So trying to find people based on their potential contribution to theory development and I think in an area like this ideally we're looking for people who either have had some experience of thinking about this or who are interested in it as a topic and want to talk about it so both of those sorts of areas we'll, we'll be looking for and we're planning for about 40 to 60 interviews and I'm, I'm leading this work package. Next slide please. And then the third work package, which feels a bit in the distance, so I've said less about that. Um, this is Jo Langley, who's going to be leading it at Sheffield Hallam. So Jo is going to take all of our programme theories we've developed in work packages one and two, and we're going to really take that through into the development of the Piper Toolkit, and Piper stands for Pathways to Implementation for Public Engagement in Research Toolkit. So this is going to be... Um, a four step sort of workshop development process that Joe has used before and it's a particular design approach which looks to me really exciting and the end product we hope will be a set of guiding principles um, and then that will be supported by practical resources so it will mean that an individual individual or a group is able to um, make their own decisions about how they want to be involved in implementation at different levels um, and, and what they actually want to do and what support they actually need to do that. So work package three will, will, um, uh, will take place with work in between the workshops in terms of the design. But this is exciting for us because it will take those concepts and actually make them um, into practical resources. Next slide, please. And then the final work package will be led by Krisha Jejuts at Kiel, who I think is on the call. Um, and this is going to be an evaluation of Piper in terms of three pilot case studies. Um, and we're interested in relevance, usability, accessibility, and then anything else that people want to feed back. So we're interested, this is the sort of Piper in action phase, I guess. We're interested to understand the experiences of individuals and teams who are going to be using Piper. And again, realist evaluation will inform how we do that in terms of what works for whom, why, and in what context. So it will help us both do the work, do the research, and also the analysis of the data as well. 
and then at the end we will produce a final revised revised version um, of Piper that is ready for use and dissemination. And um, I think our hope is that uh, it will be housed ultimately with the NIHR Centre for Engagement. So that will be Piper's home in the future, which is great. Um, and we'll think through the strategy for implementation of Piper more broadly as we go along. That's going to be part of our co-production activity. So that's the that's the fourth work package. Next slide, please. Magdalena, over to you. So yes, really, thanks for the overview of all the um, work packages, and I'm sure you can all agree that it's going to be a very busy period for us <laughs> as we as we deliver on the the things that we set out to deliver. But most importantly, developing this toolkit that people can use. Um, but it's really important for us this research, not just because, as Sophie said at the beginning, it's what you know public contributors want to be involved in um, implementing research evidence and I'm sure many of you on this call are familiar with the research cycle and the importance of involving contributors right from the beginning all the way through to getting that research evidence into practice but we really hope that this will be something that people will take up and use and it will be used by everybody that wants to have the resources and the tools not just public contributors but public involvement needs by researchers to do something that's evidence-based. So we will generate that knowledge and that evidence. So when people want to do this in practice in the future, they'll have some a really good solid starting point and a good foundation. Um, but the, I think it's important to touch upon what Sophie talked about at the start of the, the research. This is a realist evaluation and that's important to us because we know that one size doesn't fit all with everything in public involvement or co-production that you need to develop different methods. And the, the value of having a realist approach is we'll know what works for whom in what contexts. And we think that's really important as a foundation for developing this public involvement, um, this implementation toolkit, the Piper toolkit. So as I said, we really hope that at the end of this, through all the, the um, knowledge acquisition, through the interviews, through the co-design workshops with Joe Langley and I think they're really exciting because we're using Lego co-design for that. And then for testing the Piper toolkit, we'll have something that sits within the NIHR that everybody can pick up and use and then use them in their own research projects in the future. Okay, next slide, please. So therein ends our brief, very, very brief overview of the Piper project that we're really fortunate to have been funded to do because we recognize that it is an untapped resource and we want to give people the tools and the resources to be able to use an evidence-based approach to working with public contributors as partners in getting that research in evidence from whatever project into practice. Um, but we wanted to just find, um, bring an end to this um, discussion by having some questions we wanted to put to everybody here on this call who's clearly invested in the subject. And we really wanted to ask you, firstly, if you have any examples from your own areas of work where you've worked with public contributors as partners in getting that research evidence into practice, we'd really like to hear from you. And um, we'd love to hear some experiences on this call or you're welcome to contact me or Sophie. And we'd be really, really interested in following those examples up because that's exactly part of our um, evidence generating, you know, knowledge generating in the first two work packages. Um, we wanted to ask you what you as people, as researchers, as public involvement leads, as public in contributors, what you think you would find helpful from a toolkit, because obviously we're just starting out. So hearing different perspectives on what you would like in the toolkit and how you might use that would be really helpful to us. And of course, we'd love to hear if you're aware of any papers or projects that are relevant to this project. So thank you all for your attention. Thanks to Sophie for a great overview. And we look forward to hearing some thoughts from you in the room in the next part of this, this part of the session. So thanks, Sabi. Thank you very much. I will stop sharing the slides so we can see everybody better. Um, so yes, please start typing into the chat. Um, type your um, uh, your answers um, to the questions that um, Magdalena and um, Sophie ask, any questions you have, any comments you have, um, please participate. 
So I see there's already a question in the chat there from somebody called from from Hitton. Um, I don't know if you wanted to leap on and ask the question Hitton or whether you'd prefer us to read it out, but it's about um, implementing in, in public health research. Hitton, did you want to ask the question? Yeah, sorry, I was just wondering to what extent this research will inform public involvement in the, in the implementation of public health research and research into wider health determinants and policy development, because obviously, obviously wider determinants plays an important role in preventative health and health more broadly. So I was just wondering to what extent this will inform that uh, yeah. program of work. I think our intention is that this Piper will be a broad resource. So um, public health, absolutely, really, really important. And I think part of what we will be doing is, is thinking about those broader areas as we develop it. But the intention is that you could use it for any area of health and social care research in its in the broader sense and I think wider determinants um, again I think would be very relevant and, and feasible and I think as we develop Piper we'll ask ourselves those questions are we still maintaining that generic focus or are there areas that require something specific but I think at the moment our intention is very much to keep that broad focus and, and just to add there, Sophie, I think we do want it broad, but at talk, just referring to something I talked about, the diversity of our, our group, our public partners that we're working with and the testing phase, one of the things we absolutely want to make sure is that it's um, as broad as possible in terms of who we involve in that group to make sure it is relevant for different communities. So that's really important to us in getting that diversity in our, our public reference partnership group that we're working with. We really want to make sure that it's as diverse as possible in the people we work with to make sure that it's relevant to lots of different communities. So, Paul, I think you had your hand up next. Yeah, actually, uh, I'll let the uh, chat Natalia, Natalia in the chat just asked uh, a question that's not dissimilar to the one I was going to ask, actually, yeah, yeah, uh, which are there are a lot of co-produced resources for PPI already. Uh, so why do you think uh, PPI and implementation science should be different or something new? Absolutely. And, and we were asked that, actually, when we were putting the bid through all of its um, various rounds. Um, I think um, implementation science as an area is quite a specific and um, a particular area in terms of the theory, in terms of the frameworks, in terms of the thinking that drives it. And I don't think we wanted to necessarily assume you could just bring in a public involvement resource and apply it in the same way, because we know that from other work that when you look at particular theories and um, methods, sometimes you need to think about how you adapt what you do and try to build it into the area so that the people working within it recognize what you're trying to achieve. So we were very aware of that. But the other part of this is that, you know, we know that implement the evidence is published, it goes out there to the public, well, to, to professionals often, and then nothing happens. And that implementation or evidence to implementation gap can sometimes be 17 years and I always felt like the patients and the public contributors work we work with are often incredibly action focused and we had this gut feeling that actually people out there for whom the evidence is is a key part of their lives are probably going to be possibly slightly more effective than the healthcare professionals at taking it and doing something with it and of course you'd necessarily want to think about the partnership or the leadership or the support that and how that works but it felt like you know we've got this big gap in producing evidence and then implementing it and yet we've got this group of stakeholders or public contributors or patients who really aren't part of that world yet so those two rationales were why we thought actually we really need to look at this in more detail within the field of implementation science. I hope I've answered that, Natalia. And I see Christian Hudson's got their hand up. Christian? Hi there, yes. Uh, Christian Hudson from the Yorkshire Humber, uh, Yorkshire Humber um, ARC. Um, it, yeah, I think I was just um, thinking that I wonder if um, Work Package 4 could come a bit earlier because the, what what 
me and my research fellow uh, in Yorkshire often see is a lot of toolkits out there for other things. I, I understand, I agree with, with a lot of your points about you know, implementation being quite a different thing, but it, but you know, you, you know, one project we were working on as a toolkit, uh, which is 300 pages long, it's, it took many years to produce, but it doesn't actually tell anyone how to implement the, the intervention. Um, that's practical knowledge, which, which will come from trying. And it's the same with this. You may end up with a toolkit that has all this guidance, but then when it comes to, say, a research team that want to involve members of the public, they still have to, they'll only really learn how to do that by trying, um, because it, that's where you get the practical knowledge. So, you know, Work Package 4, I really like this idea of practical, uh, I can't remember the exact wording, but practical insights. And I wonder, perhaps it might just be really good to find something that needs that people want to implement, that a research team wants to implement, and then approach some people, create a PPI group, and involve them from the very beginning, and actually try to implement something. And then by doing that, you'll learn how to in involve these people in implementation research. You'll get insights that you won't get from the literature, or that you won't get from asking people about the literature. You get it from trying. And so, I mean, that that's just my thought because you know, I, I hope I've explained that anyway. But um. Yeah, yeah. So that's my thought. What, have you got any uh, thoughts on that at all? Um, yes, uh, uh, just a couple of things. I might ask Chris Shah to respond as work package for lead. Um, I think much of what you say, Christian, is very much at, at the heart of what we want to achieve in terms of, um, you know, this is going to be about public involvement in implementation practice more so than implementation research. It's going to be, how do we actually do it? How do we implement evidence with our public contributors? And it's going to be healthcare teams, knowledge mobilization fellows. It's going to be the reality of practice, the sort of, you know, the real sort of impact it can have on people's lives as well. So I, I think many of those elements potentially will be relevant, but, but I think our focus on trying to understand how it could work in this area gives us the sense of needing for this project to, to need to be done. I think we've almost got to collate our knowledge about what we know. That includes practice knowledge and gather our thinking and just try and edge forward in terms of the practicalities of this. But Krisha, do you want to add anything from your perspective? Yeah, no, I think you've answered the, those questions re really, really well. Um, I mean, at Kiel, we, we we've perhaps more the other way we we've got lots of practical examples of giving it a go um we've got a, a link group a lay involvement in knowledge mobilization group that that arose from our public involvement in research group to to work with us on on how we take innovation out into the real world and i think it was absolutely as you say those practical experiences of what seemed to work and then what clearly wasn't working that really led to us wanting to be involved in this program and particularly take the work package that is that practical implement uh, you know the practical guide to implementation how can we equip people who are starting this journey or in the thick of a journey and notice that something's not going so well um how might you lift lift their approach and help them recalibrate their thinking uh, uh, in terms of the co-production and, and natalia's points very well made and I think you, you know it often this is built on our public involvement in research which is very well described it's very good it's got good um, standards and approaches and guidelines and we know got what good practice is we've got you know 15 years with, with the NHR examining each other on how well we're doing it and delivering it but as soon as you stray away from that that environment and you're working with other stakeholders who perhaps haven't got that as part of their culture it's how can you offer them the guide to um, to get cracking and to have a good experience and for the public keep coming back to help them on, on their next challenge as well but I'm loving the ideas in the um, in the chat as well about other other kind of spaces perhaps to consider case studies so I think that, that's really helpful thank you Sophie thank you thank you Krisha um, I think we're going to have to bring the discussion on this particular part of the of the afternoon to a close um, uh, but please um, keep writing into the chat um, uh, and keep the discussion going. And uh, Sophie and Magdalena, I'm sure, would be delighted to to hear from you. Lots of interesting um, ideas that have been raised um, in this dis discussion already. Mm -hmm. I would like to um, hand over 
to um, Professor Lucy Yardley from the Universities of Southampton and Bristol, who's going to speak about integrate, integrating co-production into implementation research. Ah, th thanks, Savvy. And uh, were you going to do the slides or should I share my screen? Would you like to share your screen? You should okay. be able to do so, Lucy. Right, I'll give it a go. Okay, is everybody seeing that? Thank you. Great. Okay, yes, so um, I'm a theme lead in Arc West, uh, so uh, working with Sabi, and um, she suggested that it might be useful to share, oh, if I can get it to, yeah, there we go, um, to share what we're doing to, to try to address one of our key theme objectives, which is to evaluate and refine methods for developing and adapting interventions and disseminate methods about how to design and optimize interventions to ensure they're accessible to diverse communities. And there are two methods I'm going to talk about very briefly here. Uh, one is our updated person-based approach to intervention development. And our, uh, the other one is the agile co-production and evaluation framework, which is new. And to start with the person-based approach, uh, some of you might have come across this already because it's now quite widely used for intervention development. But I think people aren't necessarily so aware of the aspects of it that, that relate to co-production and to implementation. So that's just what I wanted to talk about very briefly today. Um, and I, I've put on here the website for uh, all of the um, resources that are going to be talking about today. So what you can see is that um, in this is actually the update that we did a couple of years ago um, and put online, um, where along with the thinking across everybody really, we uh, paid more attention to the central role for PPI and stakeholder co-production. And uh, we really go into this in two ways. And that's, uh, we, we were asked by Sabi to talk about uh, general principles today. Um, one of our principles is that we almost always have two ways, uh, two key ways of approaching P PPI and stakeholder co-production. Now, the first is to have uh, people that are working throughout the project uh, from the beginning of development to the end of implementation as a core part of the research team. Um, and those people obviously are an equal part of the research team. And uh, so they just simply are team members. However, we always try to complement that with a different kind of PPI involvement, which is to have additional consultations, which can be one-off consultations, workshops, focus groups, discussions, online commentary. And the reason why we have both kinds are because the people that you work with uh, for a long time, for a start, it's only some people that can get involved in that way. So it has to be people that have the capacity and the motivation to put in a long, uh, a lot of commitment over a long time. Um, but those people are going to be different from some members of the same community or, or members of other sectors of the community that you're maybe not reaching that way, who maybe would have valuable views and would be willing to share with them, uh, but would only want to do it as a one-off or as an occasional thing. And so we see these two kinds of ways of involving people as really complementary. And uh, I'll give you an example that at the moment, uh, we're co-producing an intervention for uh, teenagers to help them with their sleep. And we actually asked them, uh, we, we had a, a, an initial um, engagement using uh, established Arc West um, groups of young people um, and, and it was an online meeting. They, they preferred online for the meeting. Um, but we have now got uh, 144 people, uh, young people from various schools and colleges 
in uh, less advantaged areas um, who have said that they do want to input, but most of them would rather do it by online commenting. Um, so that's just the way that uh, young people tend to want to get involved. So what we do is we offer all these different ways of getting involved to people um, and, and these two core bits. And uh, just going back to the implementation uh, theme, now the person-based approach has always been about the whole cycle, the whole research cycle, but we now make that even more clear. That's why we have this sort of circular <laughs> representation of it, because people thought it was a bit linear going from development to implementation. But actually, it's very much about the Hubble cycle. And I'm just going to very briefly illustrate that uh, with how we implemented it just recently during the um, pandemic. So uh, this illustration is about our germ defense intervention which uh, was originally developed by our team uh, to uh, try to prevent uh, infection transmission during a pandemic. And we first piloted it during the swine flu pandemic. And then we actually trialed it after that um, and showed that it was effective at reducing infection transmission in the home. And so when the, this pandemic hit, uh, we rapidly got funding to update it for COVID in various ways. And we updated it within a month, uh, relaunched it. And uh, so we were then uh, implementing it and continuing to update it throughout the pandemic. And to just show you what that looked like, um, th this is actually what we ended up with right at the end, a, a very brief infographic. This is half of it. Um, and the reason why we uh, ended up with an infographic was that uh, through our sort of um, citizen science in the implementation, we were asking all users to feed back to us any ideas for improving the intervention. And one user said, well, my 14 year old autistic son wouldn't manage to uh, get to engage even with the sort of five to 10 minute online advice that we're giving. Uh, can you produce something that is even simpler and briefer for him? So we, we produced this infographic, and then as you can see, uh, went on and developed it in other languages and so on. So that's to give you an idea of, sort of what the implementation was like. And this is how we did it. We had our regular team of PPI contributors. Uh, some, uh, one of them had uh, a relevant health condition uh, who were working as equals with clinicians, public health professionals, us. Um, we were also doing positive research and online surveys and uh, gathering data on how people were using the intervention. And we're integrating that. And then what happened in terms of uh, the PPI and stakeholders getting involved with the implementation, uh, we, uh, our, our PPIs got involved in helping us do media coverage coverage they actually co-authored a bmj analysis publication uh, which was taken up very much by the media the daily mail and the national tv and so on um, we worked with local public health teams and international networks um, and uk hsa as it used to be public health england um, and actually through the arc west we rolled out germ defense to all the gp practices in england as national priority public health study and so we did manage to get um over half a million users uh, and actually uh, through citizen science a lot of people in the university said is it okay if we translate this into our own uh, language so it ended up uh, in uh, over 170 languages and being used worldwide so that's to give you an idea of sort of how flexible and rapid you can be with uh, using PPI input in um, implementation. So I'm just going to finally talk about how we're taking that forward in the future in what we've actually called the, the uh, framework of Agile Co-Production and Evaluation, ACE for short. The lessons that we identified from the pandemic was that we need to be able to do this kind of work much more rapidly. Um, and what we really need to be able to do is put together rapid co-production of interventions and messaging, which was happening during the pandemic, with also rapid evaluation of what was working in terms of what was actually changing attitudes and behavior in the ways they needed to change. And 
what we saw during the pandemic was that we had a lack of evidence for what kinds of messaging was working with which communities. And we had a lack of ways of doing this really rapidly. So what we've now done, I, I would like to say straight away that we're co-producing this framework and it was actually our PPIs that said, you need a figure that summarizes very, very simply what ACE is all about. So this is the figure that we co-produced. And uh, it's, it's really that um, it's not new to do co-producing. It's not new to do mixed methods uh, uh, evaluation. Uh, what doesn't seem to be happening enough at the moment is putting both of those together and doing them really fast. So I'll just leave you with a couple of examples of how we're trying to start to do that. So um, what we're starting with is how do you recruit PPI contributors and how do you work with them? And so we're actually already working with young people uh, to find uh, co-produced methods of engaging seldom heard young people. Uh, I've talked a little bit about how we've done that in one study, but uh, we're really trying to get rid of the whole uh, traditional way of uh, in engaging people in the first place um, and we're trying to co-produce recruitment materials and um, oh I think I've skipped oh yeah and and the other way that we have been doing this is um, monkeypox of course came as the successor to the pandemic uh, that needed really rapid co-production and um, we were working with Prexter and Terence Higgins Trust to try to reach people uh, that were at high risk. They were often uh, from ethnic minorities and people engaging in high risk behaviors. Um, and they helped us co-produce methods of reaching them. And uh, you can see, for example, there, the, the poster that we used that we uh, sent out over Grindr that did indeed uh, work in terms of getting PPI to immediately tell us what they thought of what the government guidance was for what you should do about Prepster. So conclusions, future opportunities. Um, the person-based approach, for those of you that know it, um, it's continuously evolving and we're continuously, uh, now we're using it for uh, optimizing official guidance, participant recruitment, other study materials, um, and as you saw, implementation. And uh, that's a community that is now starting to get more widely used, not just by researchers, but for example, AHSNs, as well as the private sector. Um, and the ACE framework is very much a collaboration between UKHSA and the Health Protection Research Unit at Bristol and uh, at Imperial College as well. And um, we're starting to implement that into all sorts of other interventions uh, and implementations for other things apart from the pandemic. So um, this has been very much on behalf of a huge number of large teams that I can't really mention here because it's Arc West Public Health, uh, the Health Protection Research Unit um, and so on. But uh, yeah, on behalf of my team members, I hope that whirlwind overview has been of interest to you. Back to you, Sabi. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lucy. Thank you. Do you want to um, stop sharing? And um, Paul, are there questions and comments in the in the chat for Lucy? Yes, uh, Rebecca Webb's asking Lucy, uh, where did you recruit participants for the monkeypox work? Right. Well, as I was mentioning, we, we did have ads going out, out um, on Grindr and, and that did work. Uh, it, it took us a little bit while, of a while to get them right. Um, we co-produced them. And at first we were a bit coy about who we wanted to talk to. And eventually we ended up co-producing one that says we want to talk to people that have lots of sexual partners, don't have English as a, as a first language and uh, are from an ethnic minority. And that, that worked. We ended up getting exactly people in that situation. Uh, we also started putting posters up, working with UKHSA, putting posters up in saunas and other places where people met, um, where they might be at high risk of contracting it. And, and that's how we found people. 
Okay, thanks. And Selena Wallace from Northwest Coast is also making just a, a similar comment to yourself about agility and being being agile. Uh, and I think that's in relation to work that Northwest Coast and Liverpool University undertook in uh, assessing mass vaccination and low and low uptake in uh, in underserved populations. Is that correct, Selena? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Paul. Yeah, I was just thinking about some of our public advisors that lived in areas of low vaccination, yeah. and they set up forums um, and did, did sort of rapid um, research about ideas around what might work around uh, mass vaccination, which led to the use of um, buses, um, vaccination buses in Liverpool. Yeah. Okay, back to you, Shabby. Has Sabi's link disappeared? Has she gone? Yeah, I think she's just fallen off, actually. Uh... I think she's just come back in. All right, OK. I'm back. Sorry about that. That was um, random. <laughs> Anyway, um, thank thank you very much um, to Lucy for her her presentation, and um, I would now like to see if um, Michelle Farr is on the call. Michelle, are you on the call? Because uh, the yes, I am. Lovely, thanks, Michelle. So, um, uh, our next. Um, Item on the agenda is from PPI to co-production, reflections on a program to help victims of domestic abuse. And um, it's a conversation um, between Michelle um, and Jean Fader. Um, and I think Haley is going to load the video so we can watch the video because Jean is currently, um, I think, still on flight for, uh, back from Africa. Um, so. Hayley, would you be able to share the video with everybody? Thank you very much. Can you see that? Yeah, we can. I'm Jean Fader. I'm a GP by Clinical Trade, uh, Professor of Primary Care, and up until very recently, the Implementation Lead for Arc West. Hi, I'm Michelle Farr. I'm a research fellow um, at the Applied Research Collaboration Art West. So, Jean, can you tell me a little bit about um, the programmes that IRIS provide and reprovide? Okay, so IRIS provide and reprovide more or less covers 20 years of my um, research. Uh, IRIS was a cluster randomised trial testing an intervention that was both training and referral. Uh, for GPs to respond better to their patients who were survivors of, of domestic violence. And it was a trial that showed that actually that intervention was effective. Details of the trial aren't important because what we're going to be talking about uh, now is patient and public involvement and the, the move towards co-production. So I'll say something about what that looked like in the trial and then say something about provide and we provide as well. We had then a, um, I think we called a patient representative, and we are now talking about um, almost 15 years ago. Uh, and the PPI hadn't, I think, been invented as a term yet, or maybe it had, but we, we, we certainly weren't using it. And the patient representative, Kim, uh, sat on our trial, um, steering group, not external group, but the, the internal team, the trial team it was, and contributed to the the oversight of, of the conduct of the trial, and then contributed as well to the interpretation of the findings. What was interesting, though, was that neither she nor any other person with lived experience of um, domestic violence was involved in the design of the trial. 
and nor were they involved actually in, in applying for funding. One little PS on that was that she became so interested in the research, uh, which didn't have a qualitative component, that we then managed to get some additional funding uh, where Kim actually did interviews with um, with patients who'd been exposed to the intervention. But that was a kind of unforeseen um, and, and certainly not planned consequence of her of her involvement. It was a very traditional patient representative involvement, and there was just one of her, you know, sitting on this um, this this team of, of researchers. So there are all kinds of things that obviously we would now do uh, differently. Provide and reprovide our NIHR program grants, or were, but was an NIHR program grant, which looked at extending the work of the healthcare response to include um, LGBTQ plus uh, patients and to include male survivors and indeed male perpetrators. And um, it was a, an extension of IRIS, but in, in the context of, of, a, of a program grant, it included epidemiological work, it included um, a pilot study, and it also included actually a fully powered trial of a psychological intervention following disclosure. And that was done, um, it was done outside actually with the NHS, it was done within, within the third sector. That had riding along the whole trial and the other studies, a, um, a survivor group, women with lived experience who we consulted throughout the trial, two of them then also attended our, our, our team meetings, um, our, 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 our research team meetings, program meetings, and again, were involved in oversight of conduct and, and interpretation of findings, and actually had a real role in what then, these are all terms that were new then, um, knowledge mobilization and knowledge exchange. So when we did um, presentations, uh, one of the uh, women uh, in the uh, the PPI group actually had their own presentation to do to to talk about the trial. So it was definitely a, a step up from just having a, a, a patient representative. But <laughs> that group was not involved in the design of, of the program. So when it came to reprovide, which is the program we're we're now still um, plowing that furrow of, if one can say it like that. Um, which includes an individual randomized trial of a perpetrator program and a pilot of a full, what's called IRIS plus, men, children, as part integrated with the IRIS program and doing that as a, as a pilot um, a pilot study. The design of that program was, it did have the survivor voices in them. And in fact, what we did is the, because we had other studies that also, um, required PPI of, of, of survivors, uh, people with lived experience, we we use those groups to then design the, the new program. So it was, again, a kind of a move nearer to what, what you would call co-production. I wouldn't call it genuine co-production, though, because the idea of the studies still came from, from researchers and, and also actually came from third sector collaborating organizations, but it didn't come directly from survivors, but they were very much involved in the design um, and, and have been involved in, in the knowledge mobilization around that. So what, yeah, that, that's kind of a description, mm -hmm. which is what you wanted of, of, of what the studies were and how we grew over time into a much more engaged PPI. Um, and the other thing to add is that for reprovide, we also have two other um, PPI groups. One is of male victims. We don't, they don't meet together. And the other is what you might call ex perpetrators or men who have used abuse and have been through a, a perpetrator program. And we're doing, we're, we're in something called a relapse prevention group. And we engage them as PPI mm. to think about the design and the conduct of, of the trial. So much more, um, if you like, engaged than, than that original model in IRIS. So how have the uh, PPI groups been then involved in implementation and impact in terms of the changes that the programs have made? 
So I've said a bit about that in relation to they were involved in, in sort of more kind of this KM activity. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of implementation there, it sort of takes another sort of twist because Iris is probably the, the study I've done, which has been implemented most in, into, into a kind of a national program. And the way there was PPI in that was the mechanism for that was a social enterprise now called Iris I. And from the beginnings of Iris I, there were um, lived experience, a lived experience group, maybe not call it PPI, but it's no longer research really, it's, it's yeah. about implementation, um, involved in advising and working together with what became the social enterprise. So the, the, the actual genuine implementation, you know, post-trial work um, moved away from a kind of PPI model. And I guess there's more of a um, stakeholder model. I mean, in a sense that, you know, survivors who have an interest in, in good services became, became a, a strong stakeholder voice. Not the only stakeholder, but a stakeholder voice. Um, so yeah, that, that was how they became involved in 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 implementation. the The implementation of some of the other studies that were in the in provide and reprovide, um, none of them have had this sort of scaling up that, that Iris has. But when we present to commissioners, we will use voices from um, from survivors from the PPI groups about why they think this is a really important program which which should be commissioned so i guess they're they're part of the like the selling of a successful intervention that need, needs commission great and as a final question what kind of key learning would you share with others from your experiences in terms of kind of like the implementation of research you, so I, i'm, I'm going to answer that question after i answer the a, a kind of prior question which is about um you know what would I advise, or what would I say, or kind of must dos in relation to 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 genuine PPI that moves towards co-production? And I kind of already said it. It has to start from the beginning. And I think the real challenge isn't just getting um, people with lived experience or whatever the condition is when you're designing the study. I think the real political challenge is that the priorities of what needs to be researched we need to hear from people with lived experience whether it's diabetes or depression or, or domestic violence so to me that's the thing i've really kind of learned the hard way that that's that's genuine that's moving towards genuine co-production now around implementation i think it's you know it it the, i guess the main lesson the small lesson is your um ppi collaborators if i can call them that have a really good role in in dissemination and, and knowledge mobilization which i think is a kind of necessary step towards um obviously towards implementation not because i believe in some pipeline you know i don't believe it's a pipeline i believe it's a much more iterative process but they they can be part of that and that means getting them funded mm -hmm. for that that implementation phase and of course this is a debate now in is moving towards allowing you to have funding at the end of a study to to knowledge mobilize and move towards implementation. I think make sure the funding for PPI goes right through to the end because you're gonna you're gonna need those guys. That that that's part of what 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 they have to offer. So um I think when it comes to implementation, which isn't in a sense funded by the original grant, and then one's looking at other mechanisms of implementation, so not so much implementation research, but actually doing the implementation, you know, working with partners, we've been blessed with good third sector partners who take the lived, the lived experience seriously mm -hmm. and that becomes part of their almost their governance and, and, and their aims um but Michelle mm -hmm. the thing is that I have to know that you're involved in a study that has actually raised co-production to to another level here um, and which also works with that tension between the, the research and implementation. And it'd be really good to hear hear about that. Yeah, it's interesting because um, I didn't sort of, uh, when we first started out on, on this uh, journey, <laughs> it wasn't, uh, we didn't actually get a research grant. Um, it was actually the first grant was an impact grant. And actually, in some ways, we turned the whole research process on its head. Um, and 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 I think that really kind of said something 
So the, the concept of the study uh, called Bridging Gaps is uh, working with women who've experienced uh, multiple and complex needs. This might be addiction, mental health, people who've experienced sexual violence, mm -hmm. abuse, um, homelessness. And one of the key things that people were saying is we've, we've been part of research before and we haven't seen any changes. Why would we want to get involved in this when we've been involved in things before and we don't see the change? And so the key priority for the group was actually let's make some changes. And whilst we couldn't promise anything, we could certainly actually put that as the priority rather than more research because the research was already there. People couldn't access primary care there was there were specific reasons around that. So actually, we were looking at how do you actually make those changes first of all. So um, so yes, we kind of started from the opposite end in a way, and and then through that process, we actually combined the lived experience um, ex experiences of of the problems of accessing primary care. Uh, the research evidence that's already out there, and then very specific pr practitioner knowledge around how how do um, primary care practices, how do they, how, how can they change? Mm. And so it was a very kind of uh, ground up kind of project um, in that we've been working with general practices and, and each general practice itself wants different models. It, it, each, each practice needs something different. And so that's interesting in itself that um, the, uh, there's not one sort of solution that you might kind of come to if you were doing a research process. Mm. But here's the template or here's the, the thing that works, now let's implement it. It mm. has been a much more organic process about being very contextualized with the with each individual practice as mm. well. And so the women have been involved all the way through that sort of fortnightly meetings. Uh, It'd be interesting to hear what some of the challenges are in, in that, um, I would say intense co-production model. Yeah, I think uh, the time is one of the key challenges and uh, actually to have those fortnightly meetings, but that is so important because otherwise decisions are being made that people aren't involved in. So actually having that having that kind of process is really key because if you don't involve people over a period of time, then things are happening that people aren't aware of. Mm. So I think that's that's something really important. People have also got quite complex lives. People have got a lot of other things going on. So it's always kind of having an open and supportive mm. approach that's been really important as well. But I think the biggest motivation is actually seeing those things change. Yeah. And then that makes such a big difference to actually what what people are motivated by because they yeah. right actually change GP practice. So we um there's uh with um a uh, general practice wellspring, there's an open doors committee. Mm. So they've got a hundred people on their books who are who have experienced complex needs who are accessing um a cont continuity of care. So there's two GPs who actually run that, mm. that clinic and they they they've got 30 minute appointments. So it's wow. quite a different, <laughs> quite a different approach, but also where we're running out okay. of time. Well, so. Right. so yeah, well we we hope we hope you find that useful and that um you have a really interesting workshop and um, sorry we can't be there thank you thanks Hayley thank you that's that's great um I'm aware of time and um because people from the bridging um gaps project that um that Michelle spoke about um in the video I I think I would like to go straight into the next session which is going to be led by Andy because I don't want to curb any of your time, Andy, and I'm sure some of the issues that were discussed in Jean and Michelle's video uh, will resurface. So um, can we hand over to you and your panel? Yes, you can. Thank you very much. And yeah, Michelle, sorry. Uh, yeah, Michelle and one of the public contributors from that project will be taking part in this panel discussion. So this will be slightly uh, different. Just very quickly, my name is Andy Gibson. I'm Associate Professor in Public Involvement at the University of West England, and I lead along with Carmel McGrath PPI in our West. What we're going to do is have a panel discussion. There's going to be opportunity for several public contributors and a couple of um, uh, health ambassadors uh, to contribute to their discussion about involvement in research and implementation, particularly looking at the issue. 
you there's a project which is about recruiting people from underserved communities to to uh, to to work with to work with us in a, on a more regular basis. Um, but I'm not going to I'm going to I'm going to crack on. One of the public contributors can't be with us uh, today, so that's going to be done by a video. So we're going to kick off with that. And the first question is. Um, what do you think are the barriers to people getting involved in, in, in research? And we're going to kick off with Olivia, who's going to be joining us by video. So, Mari, if you could do the video, please. Just bear with us a second while we get the sharing thing working. It's coming up now. That's it. There's no sound. We can't hear the sound. Oh, sorry about this. Mari, if you stop sharing and come out of that and then click, when you go to share, there's a little tick box that says include sound. Sorry about this. Hi, um, I'm Olivia. Sorry I can't be with you today. Um, I'm a Black and Green Ambassador, or I was a Black and Green Ambassador a couple of years ago, um, and that was a project that looked at the intersection of climate and racial justice. Um, that ambassador model is a, a model to connect with different communities. Um, it's being used as part of the Health Inequalities Project that I'm working on at the moment with Roy and Andy. Um, my kind of main job where I, where I earn money uh, or proper money I'm a sustainable waste consultant as a, at a company called Results Futures. Um, I do lots of other things outside of that that are more kind of embedded in, in climate justice. Thank you, Andy. Sorry, she's just they've got they've got another little bit of the video to show. Sorry about that. Oh sorry. Um, so I think there are lots of different reasons for different people potentially not getting involved in research. Um, may that be particularly health research or, or other research that's um, requiring public involvement. Um, one of the things is lack of knowledge that it is it exists or it's a thing. Um, I, I mean, maybe I'm just quite young and naive, but I, before being involved in the project, I didn't, didn't necessarily know that as kind of a healthy, okay person, I would be um, potentially a useful subject within public research um, for health. So I think it's lack of knowledge, but also really importantly, I think there's a piece around trust, particularly when you're talking about underserved or minoritized communities. Um, some of that might, it's very intergenerational as well. So it's, it's about the history. It's not necessarily about where you're at now with research. It's about what used to be. Um, I can talk from experience of black communities and there is a history um, in America, in Europe, um, and in most colonial nations around um, members of the black community being used as guinea pigs to try things out because life has been less valued. Their lives have been less valued in the past. And also, there's a lack of trust that things will actually be used and how that translates um, to the healthcare provided 
today for people. So again, talking from my own experience of the black community, there's a lot of examples, very real examples in healthcare today about how black members of the black community can either be listened to or misdiagnosed because things have historically been studied on, on white or European bodies um, or those translations and nuances haven't been taken um, into account. Um, so I think there's a lack of trust about what research actually is, how it's going to be used, um, and then also just the fact that people, um, members of underserved communities, might not actually be listened to. And if the researcher is somebody not from that community, potentially that the nuance of what is trying to be discussed might be lost, um, and the kind of maybe different forms of knowledge um, and the value of that knowledge might not be um, fully understood. Great, so that's the view for, from Olivia. So, uh, Julie, Julie Sweet, could you same question, please? Hi, um, my name's Julie Sweet. Um, I'm the lived experience, a lived experience member of Bridging Gaps. That's all I have to say. <laughs> um, yeah, so for me, I think when we're talking about barriers to research, I think one of the main things I hear quite a lot, and I kind of think as well, to be honest, is what's the point? Um, I've been in, involved in a lot of research going back 16 years, and probably a lot of it is on a shelf gathering dust somewhere, never to be seen again. Um, so I think there can be a lot of apathy and suspicion when it comes to researchers coming into communities and kind of asking us to take part. And I would also say for bridging gaps, I think trauma is, plays a massive part of a barrier to taking part, definitely. And for me, what I've learned recently, I think time, and I don't mean time commitment, I mean from a lived experience member, me having that understanding <laughs> which has took quite a while for me to get this understanding is how long it actually takes to make change and to kind of get things changed and I think for me I've definitely been guilty of well I've given you the answers <laughs> so where's the change and I think a lot of people kind of in research do have that because we don't get that we don't maybe don't understand the kind of intricacies and what has to go on to enable change um, and I think research burnout, <laughs> I think that's a massive thing. I think so many times researchers will come in and ask questions and it doesn't seem relative and it just seems the same old, same old, and <laughs> it can kind of get to the point where it's, like I said at the beginning, what's the point? Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. That is really good. And I think it just highlights some of how big some of these issues are. Uh, our next contributor is going to be Adele Webb. So Adele, do you want to introduce yourself? Hello, everyone. I'm Adele. Um, I've been a public contributor for about nine years now, but I came into it as a carer, mm -hmm. having worked with my local hospital trust, um, working with interviewing carers of patients living with dementia and then also looking at care on the wards for patients who didn't normally have voice um, and then since then i've worked with the ahsn on, and with quite a bit of evidence into practice experience i've worked on the genomics um, the 100,000 genomes project and with that being translated into normal care I'm currently working with ArcQuest. I'm on a research study um, looking at paramedics in primary practice, but I'm also just finishing five years on the funding panel for NIHR for health and social care delivery. So that's my background. Um, as far as barriers, a lot of people have said things reassuringly that I've got here that sort of the echo. Um, one of the things, um, I think one of the barriers is trust. Um, in the concept of research, I still think there's a legacy of, of sort of people feeling like they're reluctant to be a guinea pig. Uh, so I think that's still something to, to think about. And also that, does it apply to me? How does it apply to me? As you know, that, as somebody said, that if, if it's, if you're healthy and young and fit and everything else, well, how is research going to affect me? I think academia is very 
off-putting for people, um, the loftiness and the formality of it or the, or the perception of it as that. Um, and I really don't think there's enough publicity about success stories. You'll get it in sort of national level, but also it's local. And I, I would, um, you know, when the research actually reaches the service user, I don't think enough fuss is made about it. And I would, I would take the genomics, the good example that we could learn from, because that went from, you know, really, really um, specified, a, a really restricted area, and it's now in normal practice. And I can see when something happens to somebody, and I can think, oh, that, I bet that that goes back to the genomics and the fact that now people can have their genome se sequenced and they'll get really personalized care, but it's not pointed out enough. And I think that would that would persuade a lot of people to see the positive effects of research. Thank you, Adele. And now I'm gonna hand over to Roy, who's another ambassador. Afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Roy Kareem. Um, as Andy says, part of this project called the Health Ambassadors, which as Olivia mentioned, was inspired by something called the Black and Green Ambassadors for Bristol, which I was also a part of and which have been running for the last few years and in the city of Bristol. Um, so to answer or to try and give my views on some of these questions. So first off about the barriers, and I think it, I'm going to echo much of kind of what our three people have said before, but I think there's number one, there's just this piece of just like this idea of the word, the terminology research, like, what is that? What does that even mean? How does that relate to me? Um, and then even once you've kind of got, got that comprehension, um, I think there's also just this idea of people who might be interested in it will have the social resources that, um, to participate. So whether that's about confidence, knowledge, finances, you know, we just heard there about time, um, all of those things. So sort of, if you want to, you know, think about intersectionality, like different things layering, layering on top of each other, even if you haven't got one of them, you've got the other things which are sort of preventing you. Um, Olivia also mentioned this idea of historical context of being undervalued. So yeah, you kind of, you get maybe used and discarded if you're from one of those communities. Um, and even if you do hear about something again, you don't see a sort of a tangible benefit to your community. So, you know, you maybe you get a report sent back to you or you see that, yeah, maybe you see the data somehow, but it doesn't actually feel like it's contributed to your sort of lived experience and what you're going through. Um, the sort of second question about why don't people sort of make more use of research? And, you know, I was taking this question to mean the people who might have the power to commission the kind of research. I think probably there's still quite a sense of, that's really resource intensive at the front end without any sort of immediate or visible return on your investment. And I think that's probably just to do with the fact that we live in quite sort of short cycles. We wanna see quick returns on our investment. Um, and yet a lot of this can be sort of quite longitudinal sort of slow cycles. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's everything I've got for right now. Thanks for that. Since we've heard a lot of public contributors, I thought we'd finish on this particular question by giving a researcher an opportunity to say something. So, Michelle, what's your response to hear that? It's not a fair thing, really, to put on Michelle's menu. What's your response? Oh, what's your <laughs> That's fine. Thank you. So I'm Michelle Farr. I'm a research fellow at the Applied Research Collaboration West. Um, and yeah, I agree with um, everything that's already been said. I think a couple of extra things that I'd, I'd say from a researcher perspective um, is uh, research tends to go in projects. So I think Bridging Gaps has had five different grants so far, and we have to keep reapplying for more money and then fitting the funders' um, requirements. So when you're building relationships with uh, communities who find it hard, sort of you need that long-term approach, that, that's a, a clear structural issue. Um, the other thing is a call to researchers, really. Um, how do we want our research to change things? What do we want to change from our research and how are we going to do that and who are we going to involve? I think that's really important before we start out on any piece of research to really think that through, first of all, because the worst thing is to then involve communities when you don't know where or how that's going to change. So I, I think that's a really important thing. So I'll hand back to you, Andy. Cheers. Thank you, Michelle. And by the way, these questions have been posted in the chat in a Padlet. So if people who are in the meeting want to put their contributions to these questions, then they can do. Um, right, we've got a second question, which Roy's already touched on. 
Um, why don't people make more use of, of research in the search communities? And um, again, Olivia is going to contribute by um, video. I think we've sorted out the technicalities this time around, so I hope it's going to work a bit more smoothly. And yes, it is. Again, um, there are going to be lots of different reasons in lots of different situations why research um, isn't used, and those will be different for maybe members of communities. So kind of that bottom up approach uh, to research versus the top down or so policy which arguably sits above research in some ways versus research is using that from a community perspective again it comes to that lack of knowledge i think sometimes research not just health research um, but all research is held is held separately on purpose because it's of intellectual value um, there's this perception that you need to be a certain type of person or a certain level of understanding or intellect to be um, allowed in to that group of people that understand what's going on. So it's held not only through literally lack of access to how you can access papers and research, but then even when you do have that available to you, it's, is this stuff actually translatable? Um, you know, is there a paragraph at the end that says, and in the real world, this means X, Y, and Z. Um, so I think that's one of the main barriers for community groups and also Another barrier being the situation in which the research has taken place. If the research is so far removed from reality or the reality of the group that which wishes to use it, you might as well just try it yourself. Like try things out um, as opposed to base things on research that's going to have so many caveats and but ifs and what ifs that it, it loses its um, applicable value. Um, I think there are lots of different research why kind of um, reasons, sorry, why maybe researchers and policy makers don't use research as much as they should. Um, policy is obviously very much linked to the current political cycle um, and there tends to be an element of longevity that's needed um, for research findings to have come out um, and then for there be time to implement them. And I think very rarely do political cycles align with research cycles. That's probably one of the reasons why um, policy makers don't necessarily um, listen to these things. And again, there's an element of nuance um, with research that might not necessarily sit with the kind of more broad stroke way that um, policy making um, and potentially when you're looking for eye catching policy tends to want to be formed. Um, so, yeah, that's what I think there. Great, thank you. And again, Julie, so what's, what was your response to that question, please? Um, for one, I think there's too much research out of there, too much out of date research, too much not irrelevant research. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. That's good. <laughs> um, yeah, and I think for me, I come from a, my lived experience is addiction, homelessness, and um, sexual exploitation. So for me, I think the research needs to be really specific to the community you're trying to engage with. So there's no point coming to me with a domestic violence kind of approach when it needs to be specifically for women who've been um, sexually exploited. I think it needs to be really kind of specific. And one other thing is what really winds me up is that a, sorry I say it's good is a lot of researchers come and then they have this pot of funding to do this bit of research they come into our community they do this research it's all singing all dancing we're all getting excited and then the funding runs out and you move on to your next bit of research in totally a different area and we're kind of like left there thinking okay Again, I'll say it, what was the point? Um, so I think there needs to be more of that. And also what we were saying about policymakers, we need to be have policymakers in on the conversation as well. And I think to I think it's easy to say, oh, it's hard to do that. It's not e it's not easy and it's not that hard really. If you ask them a lot of the time, if you reach out to these people, it just takes reaching out and asking them to attend because we can all sit here and come up with all the research in the world if it isn't getting to where we need it to get to which in a lot of the cases is the policy makers you know then yeah 
That's great, Julie. Um, really good. <laughs> Don't apologise for your contributions ever. They're great. Um, and then the next person up is Adele. I'm going to echo some of what Julie said there as well. That um, for me, the when you pose the question, why don't people use research? And I was thinking, well, which people don't use research? For us, it feels like at the bottom of the pile, you can only get it when somebody says, yes, it's OK. You know, we can use this. So it for me, it centers around power and the perceptions of power, where that power lies. Um, it and the, And the power is is lying in policy and priorities which we are not used to having a say in um, it's commissioning and funding limitations that to me always seems the, the biggest block for why research doesn't get out there um, and that's really sad i think that it's a negative thing that that commissioning and funding is seen as limiting and, and negative rather than enabling i know it's not right across the board, but it's just often that's why the research to me just seems not to get out there. And I think the other thing is that patients and the public don't know how to challenge or what avenues to, to take to, to be able to share that power, um, because it is going to take quite a push to make that work. Um, so for me, it's, it's about sharing the power, the strong public voice throughout research pathway should ensure uh, an even stronger public voice at the dissemination and implementation stage to make sure that it's really relevant and, and gets out there to what, you know, to what we need and want. Great, Adele, thank you very much. And Roy? Yeah, and I was obviously so excited the first time around that I started to answer that question in my first little bit, but so that was really kind of commenting on, again, things that um, I think Olivia was mentioning around the, the sort of short-term cycles that I think are often policy based or politics with a with a, a little p or a big p um where in fact you need sort of much longer term thinking in terms of being able to put the investment in if you're actually going to do this kind of research really well and then i think i'd really yeah expand or amplify and say yes to adele's point around i think there's a potentially a perspective which is to do to do this kind of work there will be a loss of power because you, you'll be less in control by sort of getting other people involved where, and I don't know, because this is kind of my first involvement where in fact, when it's done well, it's an amplification of that power. It's not a loss of power. But I think, you know, people, people like managing their grants, people like their sort of their teams that they know. Um, and so I think there's probably a fear of the unknown of just like, you know, if I have to get other people involved then I have less control. And I think that's just an, an uncomfortable feeling for people. Thank you. That's a really good point. And um, finally, Michelle, on this question. Oh, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, um, I, I'd like to pick up on the point that Adele made, uh, particularly around power. And um, I think I've heard a few, com in a few conversations, I've heard researchers actually saying, well, I don't really have the power to change things. And I think we really need to think through about what power we do have, because we do have power everybody has power within our own positions wherever we work within institutions and julie i hope you don't mind me saying this but yes. julie's pretty amazing person to work with entirely very inspiring <laughs> she has managed to change policy so if julie can do this i think researchers yeah. also need to step up and be able to make that change as well so i think actually sharing power actually thinking about it's it's a really i think just to pick up on something christian was saying earlier it's about how, doing it in practice that people learn that that comment I think is really important because from my involvement with bridging gaps, that was how I've learned about how to do this. So I'll I'll, I'll finish there. Great, thank you, Michelle. That's really, great. really helpful. So we've got one final question. It's the obvious question, which is, what do you think needs to change? And again, we're just going to hear from Olivia and, 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 and the other contributors. Um. So what do I think needs to change? Probably lots of things. Um caveating all my thoughts with the fact that I'm very new to particularly public research. My background is engineering, so I'm not new to the world of academic research, but particularly this public health piece is something I'm new to. So please feel free to take my opinions with all of um, those caveats. I think what, one of the things that needs to change is that accessibility and applicability piece of, of what research has to be done. And I think it's it's where public involvement happens. Um, so I think there tends to be a lot of um, or more 
ask for public involvement at the implementation phase, but if you've already got 80% of the way down the line, but actually you should have been going down a different route completely, that, that little bit of public involvement in the end doesn't necessarily hold as much value and weight as it should. And I also think it's about um, the embedded belief that public involvement is, is an important and valued piece of the research cycle. Um, if it's a tick box exercise, which much of diversity and inclusion stuff is, people participating are going to feel that and it's not going to have the same value for anyone, both the researchers and the public um, being involved in that. So I think it's really important um, that it's uh, the researchers truly believe in that public involvement piece. And finally, um, I would say this obviously because I um, we've been trying out this ambassadors model, but I also think it's really important um, that we're working in a more cross or multidisciplinary way. So that could mean across different sectors bigger than that. So for example, health and engineering, that could be for the more niche um, groups within health research, but also it could mean um, academics. So the, the staff who have supported um, this project at the University of the West of England, working with community organizations on that more long-term basis. Um, and creating a relationship that hopefully means that the people who I'm talking to might talk a bit more openly or a bit more differently or that trust and, and understanding from shared lived experience can be developed a bit quicker so that maybe people talking to me um, might say very different things to if they were talking to a Dr Smith, um, PhD, XYZ, CRE, um, who they might not have the same relationship with. So I think it's about pro approaching things in a much more holistic way and not necessarily, I appreciate how hard this might be to do in practice, um, but not necessarily being so deliverable and outcome focused and more process focused. Because even if the deliverable isn't quite right um, for this particular project, if you've done the process right, there's value there for when the next project comes along. Um, so that, you know, you can do that process again, potentially with those same people and get potentially a better outcome for what's difficult. So, yeah. Great. Thank you, for Olivia, to Olivia. And, um, yeah, Julie, please, what's your thoughts? Um, so what needs to change? Um, I think, for one, I think researchers need to step out of the box a little bit and look at doing things a little more differently not just your generic kind of research kind of model um and stepping out your comfort zone I think that's a massive thing because I think you know with lived experience we're already out of our comfort zone especially for the women in bridging gaps with trauma and kind of addiction when we're giving feedback we're already massively out of our comfort zone so there's a bit of that kind of thing of stepping out your comfort zone and also, I love your health amb ambassadors model. I think that is a massive thing. I think we, when we do, when people do research, is empowering that community that you're going into. Do you know what I mean? When you walk away, to me, <laughs> I'm not a researcher, so I don't. But I would just assume that when you're going in to help a community or to try and make a change. When you walk away, you want to feel you've done something to do that. And I think empowering people in that community to become ambassadors and that kind of stuff is really important. I think there is, like um, Olivia said, there's so much knowledge in that area, but it's not tapped into and I don't think it's valued as much. And I'll put, I'll even say it's not valued as much numerically as in remuneration, is that the right word? You know, and just as in, like we were saying earlier, of as a lived experience member, so a lot of the times I've come up with ideas where it will be shot down, but then the researcher can come with, it's the same idea, but she's just worded it differently. And I think there's that kind of, is knowing your community, if you, you know? That's that. That's excellent, Julie. Um, I think I'm absolutely right about the language and about somebody can say the same thing in a different type of word and it gets a completely different reception. I think that's a really, really important point. Adele. Well, the context for what I'm going to say is that I think that COVID has opened up our thinking 
the effects of research are probably much more um, uh, that people are aware of the effect and but also the speed with which it can take take place if, if there really is a need so I think the, the climate could be right for the changes my first point would be to widen the public perspective and, uh, and for people not to think it's just about drugs or clinical trials that it can be about service and delivery as well so I think that that might help to to attract more people to it um, I think it um, research needs to be presented in a less daunting uh, less academic way that um, output should show practical outcomes beyond academic papers. Um, also, um, Jean Feder earlier on, he, um, he talked about um, uh, inviting lay members to propose topics for um, research, and um, that, that needs to be broadened amongst other funders because actually um, NIHR, when I started, we were just um, prioritising research um, papers. Now we're going right back to we are invited and encouraged, actively encouraged to make proposals for research topics. So it can it can happen. And the NIHR is also working on quite a few other things. Um, Pre-scoring now even more so there's a really really strong emphasis on what difference would it make to the service user it's the major one of the major criterions uh, how achievable is it so it um and also in reviewing papers there is much more emphasis and actually um, a designated committee member to speak purely on diversity uh e the edi issues so that again it's really sort of they're really focusing very hard on good practice and good example. And uh, lastly, they've been doing a quite a large project on community um, engagement. So I would say just watch the space for that and hope that it will have an effect. And the last thing I would say is, um, well, last two things, flexibility of approaches to PPI, which somebody's already mentioned, you know, the timings, the methods, flexible groupings, and just get the success stories out there because I think they will have a, a big impact that's me. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. That's really helpful. And Roy? Um, yeah, I think the, the thing that's occurred to me during this time, especially with the Health Ambassador Project, is so I'm a, in my day job, one of the things I do is I coach young people, teenagers from around the UK. And the first thing you start with with the, any coaching session is what do you want to be coached on? As in, what's the, what's the need of the person as opposed to my need as a coach? and kind of what I'm interested in. So what we've done with the health ambassadors, or what we've tried to do anyway, is go to the, this group of women that we're working with and like, what, what do you want to explore within this, as opposed to us coming with our sort of template of like, oh, like we're, we're interested in researching these things. Let's talk about that. We start with kind of the needs of the people and where they're at and we go from there. And I think, you know, obviously that's not realistic in all research scenarios to just sort of do whatever, you know, maybe the community wants. I think being open um, to that and flexible to that, as someone has, I think Adele just said, um, would be a really interesting way to maybe open things up beyond sort of a narrow predetermined scope of what you as a research institution or you as a researcher might be interested in exploring. Great, thank you, Roy. And finally, Michelle. Hi, uh, yeah, I, I would completely agree with uh, Roy's last point about having more community agendas as a basis for research. I think that's so important. Um, and, and I think that might start to make some of the changes that have been discussed in terms of like people feeling that they haven't got actually anything out of it. So I think communities shaping research at the very beginning is really key. I think community organisations can get a little bit fed up when lots of researchers knock on their door and say, can you help me with this individual specific research project that I've designed? And that does still happen quite a lot. And I think this is a problem of the academic culture and the way that things are set up in terms of individualistic, competitive, funded research. And so I think that some of the, the issues are in a structural issue within academic culture. Um, academic culture is kind of very individualistic, project-based, competitive. And if you look at implementation, that's actually how it's set up within the REF, actually. how What's the difference in terms of my impact 
on my research projects, whereas actual real life problems are actually multidisciplinary and context specific. So we need to kind of change how we're actually looking at research to be able to get the research be much better into practice. So I think some of those kind of things around multiple uh, synthesizing all these different forms of knowledge and actually using those to create to sort of solve real life problems is really important. Great. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you very much, everybody, for all your contributions. I, I hope this is provided food for thought. I'm going to come back to Sally now. I think he'd had a hand up earlier on. I could bring that down again. So I don't know if it's Andy, can you get closer to the microphone, please? We yeah, can't... sorry, I was going to say, I hope that's provided food for thought. I'm going to hand over back to you, Sabri. Um, I think Nahid had a, hand, had a hand up earlier on. I don't know if she still wants to speak, but um, yeah, I hope that's been interesting to people. Thank you so much to to everybody who's who's spoken. Michelle is laughing and we didn't uh, we didn't get the joke. Um, but um, thank you very much for your really interesting and and challenging contributions. Um, I would like to open um, the last few minutes up to uh, some comments from um, people um, who are willing to to speak. There are several people who who put um, think comments in the chat. I wonder if they want to speak about that. I can, if that's okay. Hi, everybody. Again, hi. Thank you. Um, I think one of the frustrations I has as a I has I have as a clinician um, is trying to implement some of the things that are supposed to be quite what, in my opinion, are quite simple. So whether it's um, changing payment mechanisms from a clinic appointment um, perspective, for example. So I've just come off a year's worth of uh, patient and public involvement workshops where we did some re um, uh, research priority setting from a patient perspective. And so it's wonderful because it identifies all the gaps in the patient pathway. But then when you take this information back to managers, for example, and do the simple things like payments or uh, I mentioned vaccinations um, in the chat, uh, and this was COVID vaccinations at the time, there's just so many barriers. And I think that's the frustrating bit. It's simple and it makes sense and patients have asked for it. And we just can't as a collective think about ways to overcome those barriers and they're not difficult. They're really not difficult. So for, sorry, for the vaccination bit, um, our patients who are mainly from the underserved Afro-Caribbean West African communities were willing to have a COVID vaccination if they could have it in a safe place. And their safe place was our clinic because they've been coming to our clinic for such a long time. And we just could not get that right. Mm. Thanks, Aideen. Yes, often they are simple things. I was wondering, Sophie, has, has this given you food for thought um, for, for the pipe project um, and, and, and some, some of the, um, the barriers people um, on the panel were talking about and the one that Aideen has just mentioned? Um, those are real things that, that we need help with, don't we? Mm. Yeah, I think it, it's been a really interesting discussion and, uh, you know, just thinking about where research sits and how, how it works and how it goes down the pipeline into something which is relevant and useful for people in the context of their own lives is still a huge area of, you know, of endeavour for us all. I think it's something people are working really hard on, but it's still a challenge. And I think, I think, Others have raised the bigger, even bigger challenge of research culture and what that looks like. And and there is a real a real problem there in terms of how we move forward and how we change that, because if anything, the, the things that are reinforcing that culture are getting stronger in my experience. So the way people are judged and evaluated is focusing so much on money, you know, so that there are some major, major challenges here that we need to think through. But it's that wider context of taking a piece of evidence, whatever it may be, and taking it somewhere where it makes a difference to people's lives. So you realise the sort of enormous complexity of all of that, but how important that is, because as as um, as others have said, what what's the point if we don't get it into the system to make a difference to people? Why are we 
why are we undertaking all the research in the first place? So I think from our perspective, it's given us a wider view of perhaps the context in which research and implementation sits, which as academics, we can be quite narrow. And I think that's the power of co-production, isn't it? That's the power of, of us sharing these experiences in such a extensive way that it really it really helps us collectively to understand it, I think. Mm. Thanks for those thoughts, Sophie. Um, it's alas, four o'clock already. It's uh, two hours that have gone very quickly. May I thank um, all our presenters, Sophie, um, Magdalena, Lucy, Michelle and Jean, um, Andy, um, Adele, Roy, Olivia, Julie, I think I've mentioned everybody. Um, thank you so much for your contributions. And um, I hope um, we'll be able to, um, to digest some of the things that, that we've heard today um, and um, produce um, an output from, 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 this, from this session that we can share more widely. I can't say anything more specific than that because as you as you have seen, the the contributions have been um, uh, on such a wide range, um, and uh, trying to bring that together is going to be tricky. But I think what we need to do is to um, is to put at the centre um, the, the the communities and especially those um, who have who have been underserved. And underserved for a variety of reasons. Um, and as I say, put them at the center of what we're trying to do. And um, Andy and his team have given us some good ideas about um, how to move on. And I'm really looking forward to the work that Sophie and Magdalena are, are doing um, in this space. So thank you very much, everybody, for, for being here today and for contributing. Um, and we will be in touch with the link to the, um, to, to the recording um, and also with um, future outputs um, from this work. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>